our Lord and not the church instituted the sacrament. A man cannot forgive sin. The priest in the sacrament is only the instrument of Christ. It's Christ who forgives and the words of absolution mean I, Christ, of you. Because this is the power of God being made available to us once and for all. It's God acting through these individuals who are the human instruments. Okay. The grace we receive from the sacraments is received according to what? So, although God is available, all of heaven is available to us in the Eucharist. All infinite, infinite power is available there in the Eucharist and in all the sacraments. But, we receive that grace according to what? According to the mode or the disposition of the receiver. If you play football and your receiver is not open and you throw the football to him, the ball is available, but what happens? He's not ready. He doesn't get it. He misses it. Another way I like to use to describe it is if I have a bottle of water and the bottle is closed, so I try to pour more water into it, it doesn't go in because it's closed. It may be the same way in the Eucharist, you're in mortal sin, you don't get in. You Not only do you not receive grace, but you commit sacrilege, another mortal sin. And if I'm open, I can receive. If I'm very open, I receive much. So how do I increase my mode or my disposition? Prayer, sacramentals, my posture. My posture has a huge deal to do with it. So the next image I show you, obviously, is an example of, uh, of increasing our disposition. When you have the Mass said so beautifully, when the altar servers are in sync, when the priest is so reverent and so slow in all of his gestures and so very careful with the body of Christ, this very act agrees with the prayers that we are being saying, that we are saying, it agrees with what? It agrees with the truth and the reality being expressed, and so therefore our dispositions are increased. When there is a lot of distractions in the Mass, when the Mass is being said hurriedly or without any preparation, if the altar servers aren't paying attention, if the entire congregation is playing with their phones or they're chewing gum and they're not paying attention, or they're all in the state of mortal sin, what happens? Their disposition is decreased. That means they, ex uh, by the very fact of the action of their body p postures, their body postures are what? They are hindering the reception of grace. So here's an example of, uh, there's flames there, because this is a uh, liturgical abuse, where the disposition is naturally decreased. When you have a priest dressed up like a clown, does this express the reality of what's going on on the altar? No, if Christ is really, we are present at the one sacrifice at Calvary, if we are present in the heavenly liturgy, why is a priest dressed with a clown? This is not, set, this is not representing the truth of the reality of what's going on, and therefore this is what? Decreasing our disposition, sacrilegious liturgical uh, events are terrible for our dispositions. This liturgical dancing, does this bring me to an understanding of Christ's real presence in the Eucharist? Does this help me to love and to adore and to worship the Lord? No. So what does this mean? Sacrilege, not only is it sacrilege, but it decreases the disposition of those individuals who are at the Mass. Alright, that's very important. The second part is very important. Ex opere operato, that's Latin. It's in the Latin axiom. It means what? That the, act, that the sacrament works by the very fact of the action performed. If the right matter is used, if the right words are said, and a priest is conferring these sacraments, it works. It doesn't matter if the priest is Padre Pio, it doesn't matter if your priest is a sinner who's got three uh, adulterous women living around. It doesn't matter. Because he is priest, even if he's in mortal sin, if he says it correctly, he uses the right elements, it works by the very fact of the action performed. Now, that doesn't mean we receive the grace as we receive the grace according to the mode of the receiver, but the sacrament is there. Jesus is really present. You have it available to you. Now, it's up to you to be open. Okay. Lex orandi, lex credendi. This is Latin for what? The law of faith is the law of prayer. What we pray is what we believe. Our prayer should manifest our belief. Our beliefs should be made real in the prayer. So, the most uh, obvious of this is what? The Eucharist. We pray that this is really the body and blood of Christ. Why? Because this is really the body and blood of Christ. That's why some, including myself, would say that irreverence is a backdoor heresy. We might say, yeah, I believe in the Eucharist. But because of our irreverent actions, we are showing to the congregation and to our children and to our friends and to our family that we really don't believe this. So people begin to think, yeah, we say we believe this, but no, we don't really believe it uh, based on our actions, right? Obviously, this is what happens. People get sick. Do they go to the Blessed Sacrament to ask the Lord for grace? No. When they are depressed, do they go to the Lord in the Blessed? No, they don't. They don't. When they, it, it, and not only that, the very fact that people are going only when they have a problem. If you really believe this is Jesus, and you're praying like this is really Jesus, and you're really living it, what does this mean? We're going to visit Him even when we're not sick. 
We're going to visit him even when we are sick and we think that we're too sick to go to the Blessed Sacrament. No, we're so sick we must go to the Blessed Sacrament. St. Gemma Golgani. One time they were saying that she's too tired, you're going to make yourself sick going to the Blessed Sacrament so early in the morning. And then she told us, said, Papa, I am so weak that I will be, I will be sick if I don't go to the Blessed Sacrament. All right, what a great saint, Gemma. Oh, my dear girl, she's so beautiful. Now, if you look at this image, I, I circled the priest, I circled Jesus on the cross. This is, a, I don't remember, it's called, the image is called the Sacraments. And I don't remember the artist's name, but it's a beautiful image because there's a crucifixion going on in, inside the cathedral, which is showing us that this is really happening on our altars. I love, I love religious art, it's done well. The seven sacraments, obviously, are what? Baptism, Confirmation, Holy Communion, or the Eucharist, Confession or Reconciliation, Holy Matrimony or Marriage, Holy Orders, and finally, the Anointing of the Sick. Alright, the Sacrament of Sacraments, the source and the summit of our Catholic faith, is what? It is God Himself. It is Jesus. It is Christ really, truly, and substantially present in the Eucharist. Again, we're just going through these briefly. The Sacrament of Initiation are those sacraments that fully enter us into the union with Christ in His mystical body of the Church. We have baptism, and again, all of these, I have images there um, of Jesus going through these actions and the apostles because he instituted these sacraments, and then I have the equivalent on what the same actions that he instituted are happening today through the Catholic Church and through the ministers. Baptism, confirmation, and Holy Communion. And again, if you look at confirmation and you wonder, why aren't I feeling the power of the Holy Spirit? Why aren't I alive? Why aren't I converting people with my homilies or my talks? Wow, well, my friend. We receive the grace according to the mode of the receiver. Baptism is what? Turning away from Satan, his pomps and his works. Does this mean that I have, oh, I'm only rejecting Satanists and worshiping Satan? No. His pomps and his work. What are his pomps and his works? This means my, uh, my lustful inclinations to sin. I have to say no. I'm not going to say that this is okay. No matter what, I'm always going to stand up for Christ and his church. I'm always going to stand up for the true, the good, and the beautiful. I'm not going to uh, compromise my faith for anybody or for anything, no matter what the consequences. Oh, man, if you can do this and then you firmly resolve with the Lord's grace to try and sin no more and you ask the, for the Holy Spirit to come to you with power, I assure you, my dear friends, you will have the power of the Holy Spirit and you will be like those at Pentecost. All right, what are the next... Sacraments, the sacrament of healing. People forget that the sacrament of reconciliation or confession is a sacrament of healing. Many times people get healed because they've gone to confession. Many times you meet Catholics who have fallen away and they've had chronic illness and they're on their deathbed practically and then they go to confession and what happens? They get healed. Why? Because sacrament of reconciliation is a sacrament of healing. And sometimes our inner sins that, that are allowed to fester in our life, they, just like I can have a chemical problem that manifests itself in a physical way, so too, spiritual problems can manifest themselves physically. Uh, for example, demonic possession, a spiritual problem, physical manifestation. All right. Anointing of the sick. There you go, another sacrament of healing. The sacraments of the service of the church, obviously, are what? Holy matrimony, giving more children, you're raising up your children to the body of Christ, and holy orders, those uh, beautiful priests who give us the sacraments. Amen. Now, there's two th very important aspects for every sacrament, and that is called the form and the matter. The matter, if you think of like science, what is matter? It's a subject, it's something uh, something tangible, some type of object. Well, the same here in the sacraments. The, the elements that are necessary for the sacrament, that's the matter. And then there's the form, or I like to think of it as the formula. The form of a sacrament consists in the words by which the sacrament is affected. Almost done. What is the sacrament of the dead? A sacrament of the dead, like confession, like uh, baptism, those are sacraments that I can receive when I am not in the state of grace, when I am in sin, either original or personal. Now, there are sacraments of the living. Now, this is very important that you not receive a sacrament of the living without having received a sacrament of the dead, or else you commit a sacrilege. Sacraments of the living are those that may only be received when you're in the state of sanctifying grace. Because, and not just because you've had a uh, true contrition, but because you've gone to confession, you've been baptized, since your last mortal sin. Hopefully you haven't committed any mortal sins, but in the society we live in, it's becoming rarer and rarer to find these holy and pure souls. But it's not too late. The Lord's grace will be with you if you go to the sacrament of the dead. Okay, this is about it. I'm not going to talk about it anymore.